I am here with Paul Dumont, whose article in BAMS will be coming out soon about the resurgence of ice nuclei research and, in particular, uh, observation. Paul, what motivated you to write this article? Uh, well, uh, I noted, noticed that there is a lot of, of activity by especially younger scientists in this research area over the last 10 years or so. And we had not actually had a gathering of people who do this, these kinds of measurements for um, 30 years or so. And so we had one in 2007 in Germany um, with a, a large group of people, maybe 10 different measurement groups involved. And um, so it, it, it led me to think back on why was it that uh, I became involved in ice nucleation research around 1980, um, and yet it took uh, nearly 30 years before we got to a period where there are a much larger group of people, uh, again, involved in that area of research, whereas I knew that when I was young, uh, this was a major topic in the area of, of cloud physics, but it, it just seemed like it had, it had gone downhill for a period, or at least plateaued during a, a period around the uh, 1980s and the early 1990s. And so I went back and started looking at the literature of how many citations were made and, and why, why might it be that it decayed and why now is it so much more important. So you're a very patient guy. <laughs> uh, yes, 30 years. That, that's right. I was persistent, I guess, is uh, what you would say. Other people might say crazy, but I, I, uh, I did persist with the research because I found it very interesting. And also, I mean, if you hang out long enough and you're the only one doing it, then you certainly can get some funding to, to, to pursue your research, I think. Well, that sort of brings up two questions. One, you know, if you're a young researcher now and you see that there's a resurgence in, in this kind of measurement work, um, what do you have to be prepared for, you know, in terms of up and down cycles in this kind of field? And what, what can cause a down cycle like that? Uh, well, uh, sometimes it's a, it's a change in uh, what, what is the favorable research topic of the day. Um, back in those days, uh, cloud seeding and weather modification research was very big when I first entered graduate school in 1979, but it, that pretty much coincided with the, down, the downward trend in that type of research. Um, it fell out of favor because there, could, there were not you know, strong indications that it was being successful and people were going to have to be very patient, 10 or 20 year experiments in order to prove whether it worked, so uh, that went down, downhill. Um, but then uh, climate research came, came on board starting in about the early 1990s, and that sort of picked up interest in, in clouds again and, and ice formation. So I think, um, well, for one, you have to have a basic interest in, in the field, and then two, you, you do sort of have to have your eye on what's, what's favorable and try to find your niche to, to get in and still be able to do, conduct you know, what you think is relevant and important research. Now you you knew some of the real pioneers in this area, and what was that uh, more of an interest that came out of your observational interests, or you were inspired by what they were doing? Right. I well, I um, I just happened to be in the right place. Uh, I was studying at the University of Albany in New York, and uh, Bernie Vonnegut was teaching my instrumentation class, and he was one of the pioneers in terms of. Um, development of artificial ice nuclei and the first cloud seeding experiments that were ever done with Vince Schaefer and so forth. And um, He was a very in, in, inspiring person. He was a very good lecturer and very hands-on and he told me about facilities where you could go to study clouds and how aerosols would, would affect clouds out at uh, Colorado State, which is where I decided to go to graduate school. And so. I was able to develop my fundamental interest in ice nucleation. And even though then it was targeted toward cloud seeding aerosols, uh, um, it morphed into interest in natural ice nuclei and how they, what role they play in clouds. Well, the students that you now encounter, uh, do they tend to come from more of a modeling interest, more of a theoretical interest? or? Um, I would say that they largely come, uh, no, from uh, more of a physical chemistry interest, actually, in, in ice formation, in ice nucleation, and aerosols. Aerosols has become a, a huge topic of research, of course, uh, especially to, to try to discern the role of aerosols in, in altering climate and so forth. What is their role in this whole picture of climate change? So they do mostly come from that, that side of the picture, yeah. Is 
is this a game changer too in the in the types of questions that are asked yeah. of the measurements themselves, or, or how the measurements are carried out now, as opposed to how they were attempted 40 years ago? The idea that the the topic itself has changed somewhat. I don't know. I think the uh, people who were into studying ice nucleation 40, 50 years ago were just you know fundamental. Uh, researchers, they, they were interested in the basics of cloud physics and chemistry, and that really motivated them to, to study. And, uh, but at, at the same time, some of them were, were anxious to find out whether there was a, an opportunity to modify clouds toward the benefit of, of mankind. So in the same sense that people think about geoengineering now, and so that certainly motivated some of the scientists, I think. So let's say you, you know, in the next few years somebody really nails down some good measurements and there are no artifacts that get in the way and you, you, you've got a real good understanding of a good count of what's going on in the clouds. How's that going to shape the research agenda? Um, well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how big this area can become. And more and more people are becoming interested in ice and clouds because that is one of the larger uncertainties, clouds period, in the climate uh, picture, uh, but I, ice clouds in particular. Um, so I, I, I think it helps that we can show that there is a correspondence between the nuclei that feed those clouds and ice formation and precipitation. That really uh, is going to encourage uh, more interest and development towards, uh, I mean, this could even help to improve quantitative precipitation forecasting, for example, when the models become more involved and are able to ingest enough information to, to, to predict based on changing aerosol scenarios and so forth. So, yeah. and you mentioned quantitative precipitation forecasting. That's an interesting, the idea that this isn't really even integrated into that sort of uh, that's work right. yet. Yeah, no, not in that, not in your day-to-day -day weather forecast models. It's not, that's right. And, and in a sense, uh, the article that you wrote for BAMS suggests there's a sort of a perfect storm of things that happened in terms of technology being better, in terms of uh, theoretical understanding being better, in terms of the topical interest changing and re reigniting this research. So in a way, yet another perfect storm like that could create a whole new wave of interest from other fields, it sounds like. Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, it's just helped a lot that the technology is advanced enough, both in the measurement of the cloud particles themselves and in uh, the, ice nuclei, the ability to measure these ice nuclei, that, that we, can, we can look for this. Uh, how, how good is our understanding on the micro scale of the way that clouds work? We think we're on the cusp of being able to do that. Thanks you very much, Paul, and I uh, look forward to reading your article again. All right, thanks.